Hey guys! So today I am going to be doing a Q&A all about Strom Syndrome. We get a ton of questions about Strom Syndrome. People want to know what it is, how does it affect Ruby's life, and so many other things. So I am taking some questions that have been asked of me by a student. She had so many great questions and I thought that it would make a great video to share with everybody. So here we go. I'm going to need to read it because it's really complex and I'm not even sure if I can describe it in that simple of a way, but I'm going to try. Strom syndrome is an autosomal recessive congenital disorder affecting multiple systems, including the brain, eyes, intestines, and sometimes the kidneys and heart. Affected individuals typically have some sort of intestinal atresia, which means a bowel obstruction where the bowel is not connected together. They have variable ocular anomalies, which is issues with the eyes, microcephaly, and even issues with renal and cardiac systems. Strom is caused by a compound heterozygous mutation in the CENPF gene on chromosome 1q41. I know that's really confusing. So it's not as simple as just some other syndromes where there's just an additional copy of a gene or a deletion of a specific gene. In this case, you have to go a lot more deeper to find Strom syndrome. So during my first ultrasound, we discovered that Ruby's bones were not measuring at the correct size they were supposed to be. So I was referred for a level two ultrasound. And during that ultrasound, we discovered that she had microcephaly, a bowel obstruction, and they were also having trouble finding her kidneys. At first, doctors thought that maybe Ruby had trisomy 18 or trisomy 13. And after an amniocentesis that came back inconclusive and negative for those two things, we just had to kind of wait it out and see what happened when she was born. Ruby was born seven weeks early because my amniotic fluid was low and the doctors felt that they could care better for her outside of the womb. When Ruby was born, we discovered that her eyes were also affected. So a few weeks into her stay at the NICU, Ruby was diagnosed with a syndrome called apple peel intestinal atresia, ocular anomalies, and microcephaly syndrome. The crazy part about this is that I actually discovered this syndrome while late night Google searching when Ruby was in the NICU. I printed it off because I could not believe how much it sounded like what Ruby had, brought it into the NICU, and they diagnosed her with that. We saw a geneticist for many years to see if there was more information about the syndrome or if there were other people who had, di had been diagnosed with it or if there was a blood test to confirm it, and nothing was happening for so long. And so eventually we just stopped going to the geneticist because we had enough doctor's appointments. And so one day, one of my friends contacted me who I had met through a parent support group online for parents of kids with disabilities. And she said, hey, you're never gonna believe this. I met this family who has two kids with what I am positive is the same exact thing as what Ruby has, but it's called Strom syndrome. And so I asked her, could I please be connected with this parent so we can chat? And sure enough, her two kids had been diagnosed with Strom syndrome, which was the exact same thing that what Ruby had been diagnosed with, except for now there was a blood test. And so at first I kind of thought, you know, I know that's what she has. I don't really need blood confirmation. I mean, so many years had passed that it just didn't really matter to me anymore, honestly. It was still so rare that it just didn't seem like it was gonna really help us to get the information from a blood test. And then when our video went viral and I had been saying that Ruby had Strom syndrome, I realized that it, at that point it really was important that I get the diagnosis so that I could make absolutely sure that I was giving correct information to people about Ruby syndrome. When Ruby was born, the doctors told me that she was completely blind. They did not have any hope that she had any vision at all. And after we got home from the NICU, I began to see that Ruby was turning her head toward light. She was excited about lighted objects, and she really did seem to be able to see light. 
And so that's when I realized that she definitely had some light perception. And doctors were saying at that point that her left eye was her worst eye. When Ruby was about two, I noticed that she started matching colored objects together. She would play with these colored blocks and she would find one of one color and then she would look for the other one until she found a match and then she would tap them together. And that's when I realized that she was actually seeing color as well. So there was no way that Ruby was completely blind. Today, Ruby definitely has usable vision. In fact, sometimes I describe it in that she has just enough vision to get herself into trouble. And what I mean by that is that Ruby's vision is just good enough that she would rather rely on her vision to navigate versus using something like a cane to get around. And so sometimes that means that Ruby does run into objects and she can't see exactly where she's going, which is a significant um, risk to her safety. Ruby can navigate our home completely independently, but when she's at school or out in the community, she always needs assistance. So she's working on using a cane and you can see more information about that journey if you click up there. So when we're out in the community, she uses a sighted guide. So which is either holding my arm or my hand and that just helps her get around safely. Ruby also has microcephaly which means small brain and that causes her to have some cognitive impairments as well which means that she definitely learns slower than other people and she also has some issues with sensitivity to sound and she can become very overwhelmed in um, loud and overstimulating environments. And again, I'm gonna have to read this. So apple peel atresia, which is also known as Christmas tree intestinal atresia, is a rare form of small bowel atresia in which the duodenum or proximal jejunum ends in a blind pouch and the distal small bowel wraps around its vascular supply in a spiral resembling an apple peel. Now that's the super complex way of describing it. But in layman terms, what happens in intestinal atresia and, um, and specifically in apple peel atresia is that the intestine in most people, it goes all over the place and its blood supply kind of follows along its path. But in an apple peel atresia, the intestine essentially wraps itself around that main blood supply. And so it's in the spiral formation that resembles an apple peel or a Christmas tree. In Ruby's case, she needed surgery to put her intestines back together. When Ruby was a baby, I think the hardest part about being her parent, honestly, was getting up to speed on all of the different medical things that I needed to know to be her parent. I had never been around someone with a vision impairment. I had never been around someone who had a lot of medical needs. And the first year of Ruby's life, she actually had 200 about doctor's appointments. And so navigating all of that, getting to know all of what all the different doctors did. I had no idea what a gastroenterologist was, what a nephrologist was. And so I would say that was the most overwhelming thing. And also just my fears for her for the future, because I worried so much about what she would or wouldn't be able to do, whether she would have a good life, if she would be bullied, whether I was gonna be a good enough mom. There were so many things that were challenging back then. Now today, as a teenager, I would say the hardest part of being Ruby's mom is just keeping up with her life, um, her mood swings, because she is a typical teenager in that way, and also managing her social life for her. I want Ruby to have the best social life possible, and so that means a lot of times that I am sort of communicating with her friends and arranging things for her in a way that would be different if she was a typical teenager. And so that's just an extra layer of um, complication being a parent, but it's so fun and rewarding to see Ruby with her friends and to see how she's growing in those friendships.
It's also so important to me that Ruby has all of the independent skills that she needs as she begins the transition out of school. Now Ruby is only 14 now, but this is the time in special education when you really do start planning for the future because we only have four more years of school left next year. And that's not a lot of time for her to gain all the skills she needs when the time comes for school to be over. Ruby's special education is focused primarily on learning independent life skills. She also receives occupational therapy, speech therapy, vision services, braille, orientation and mobility, which is working on using a cane, and adapted FIAD. That would be absolutely impossible for me to pick one because I am so proud of every single new development that Ruby has accomplished and I never take a single thing for granted. So whether it was her first steps, her first words, to doing other things on her own, I just am so proud every day of Ruby for everything that she does. I don't. I don't think that Ruby does know the difference and I think that's okay. I used to worry a ton that Ruby was gonna be bullied in school and I couldn't have been more misguided in that fear because Ruby is so accepted and loved in her school and pretty much everywhere we go. She has never been outright bullied and I think that a lot of that is because she's always with an adult and also I believe that the other kids would stop a bully in his or her tracks. Now, Ruby has been bullied in social media and I've been the one who has seen all of that. Ruby has never been exposed to any of that bullying and I'm able to protect her from that, but it still does hurt me when I see people bullying a child with a disability on social media. Ruby is driven primarily by having fun. So if an activity is fun for her or interesting, it doesn't really matter what it is. So she loves doing her work boxes, but then she also loves playing games or listening to her iPad. She loves being with Stella. So like sitting with Stella, helping me with Stella is one of her biggest drivers. Um, she loves going to the movies with her friends. She loves playing Miracle League baseball and horseback riding and swimming. And really, she just loves to have fun. Ruby and I got Stella when Ruby was four years old. Her and I had been living together for four years and to be honest, it was boring. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot of action in our house and I really felt like it was important for Ruby to understand what it meant to have a pet. I was gonna take the whole process of getting a dog really slow because I wanted to make sure I was making the right decision. But I decided one day randomly to just pack Ruby up and go to a local adoption event. Ruby and I were walking around and we saw Stella and the person who was fostering her was there. And so she encouraged me to take Stella for a walk. So we went out to the back on the lawn and Stella laid down and I got Ruby out of her stroller and Ruby crawled over and laid on Stella's side. And that's when I knew that Stella had to come home with us immediately because any dog that would be that calm and relaxed while Ruby laid on her had to be a part of our lives. And Ruby was so calm and relaxed around Stella. So we just grabbed Stella, adopted her, got a leash and took her home that day. And I have never looked back. Stella has affected Ruby's life in so many positive ways. Stella is a constant companion in her life and she really recently has been enjoying helping me to take care of Stella, which gives her a great feeling of responsibility. Now that Stella is getting older, she is 12, she doesn't really like it when Ruby lays on her and I think that's also due to, to do with the fact that Ruby's also bigger now. So, but she still really enjoys having Ruby sit by her and pet her. So Stella has definitely blessed our lives so much. The first case of Strom syndrome, which at that point was called Apopel atresia ocular anomalies and microcephaly syndrome, as I said previously, 
It was diagnosed in 1993 by Petter Strom. So I can't really say how much ongoing research was done during that time. There have been a few papers published about Strom syndrome between 1993 and today, but um, I don't know what's, what was happening behind the scenes, so I can't really answer that. Um, however, I can say in 2015, the um, specific genetic mutation that causes Strom syndrome was discovered through whole, what's called whole exome sequencing. And this was a huge breakthrough because it meant that Strom syndrome could finally be diagnosed through a simple blood test instead of just matching up with the clinical um, diagnosis of Strom. And so I've seen now, since that happened, a ton more cases of Strom syndrome have been diagnosed. I feel like most people really understand that Ruby deserves the same kind of privacy that they would want for themselves. So if there's a question about yourself that you wouldn't want to answer on social media, it's probably smart not to ask me to answer it about Ruby. Um, and that said, there are plenty of questions that make me shake my head and wonder how someone would think that I would give away that information about Ruby. So basically, um, I will never answer any questions about Ruby's bodily functions, um, her menstrual cycle, or anything else that I feel violates her privacy in any way or that makes me feel uncomfortable. And that will just change with time. But I feel like even though we do share our lives online, I think it's so important to protect Ruby's privacy and so that one day she doesn't look at the videos that we've created and feels like I gave away information about her that wasn't mine to share because it's not my right to do that. As far as I know, people with Strom syndrome are expected to live normal lives. It's not a degenerative condition in that it gets worse with time. That said, there have been a few cases of Strom syndrome in which the baby has had severe complications at birth and has not made it past that. So it can be particularly lethal in some cases. I do believe that it's staying the same, although as she becomes more understanding of her world, she's better able to describe the things and understand the things that she can see. So our understanding of what she can see increases. So it might seem like her vision's getting better, but I, I do think it's stayed the same over time. If I had one thing to say about Strom, it would be that Strom syndrome is part of who Ruby is, but it doesn't define her. She is a unique and special person all on her own, and, and uh, Strom makes her even more special and unique, but it's not the only special thing about her. Our main message with all of our inclusion efforts is to increase awareness of disability and also to show the world that every single person, regardless of their abilities, is deserving of love, inclusion, and acceptance. Thank you guys so much for continuing to watch our videos as we go through all of the issues that we're having with our YouTube comments being closed. I want to encourage you all to please subscribe. If you enjoy Ruby's videos, please subscribe and click the notification bell because that's the only guaranteed way that you're going to find our videos unless you just visit our YouTube channel every single day. But it's just easier to click subscribe and the notification bell, right? Okay, bye guys, have a great day. Thanks for watching.